interesting thing. I'm excited to catch up with you here at Mobile World Congress. You know, it's a good reminder that we've got a few sort of hard truths that we have to deal with. And one of them is that people want more data, and that means we need to activate more spectrum. So when we look at the upper mid band, this sort of 7 to 16 range, talk me through the feasibility of wide area coverage there. Yeah, so this band, of course, is, uh, you know, we'll call it upper mid band, is higher than the most popular 5G band, 3.5 gigahertz. And uh, uh, people typically think that the higher the frequency, the harder it is to actually get um, uh, in the wide area coverage. But the one thing that's interesting is uh, uh, as uh, G progresses, uh, we are getting better and better at making these uh, massive MIMO arrays and uh, giga MIMO arrays, uh, which, is, uh, which means the better integration of many more antenna elements. So at higher frequency, although the propagation is getting worse, what you could compensate it for is uh, using beamforming. So if you can put more antenna elements into the array, then you can actually uh, reach similar coverage. Uh, because of the way the wavelengths uh, changes, go up in frequency, the wavelengths reduces, the antenna is getting smaller and smaller. So compared to 3.5 gigahertz, for example, if you have something at 7 gigahertz, it will be half the wavelength of 3.5 gigahertz. That means each antenna is only half the size, or in area is a quarter the size. So for whatever array size, you will have four times more uh, antenna elements. That gave you 6 dB gain, uh, use a technical term, right? That they increase your coverage by 6 dB. So that offsets the additional propagation loss. So in some sense, as long as you can integrate more and more antennas, higher frequency is not a problem. We could actually deliver equal coverage at even higher frequency upper midband. Okay, so that's the feasibility piece. Take me through the actual kind of operationalization piece. Uh, you need a lot of alignment in terms of regulatory policy for spectrum. You need your standardization in board order, and you need your, your ecosystem on board. So what are you thinking? Yeah, so I think timing is everything, right? So everything needs to fall into the place at the same time uh, when 6G launches. So currently, there is a you know industry consensus about 6G launch around 2030. So if the spectrum can be in place a few years earlier, and uh, as technology is maturing, right? Like Qualcomm, we're doing a lot of those proof of concept, working through the uh, bottlenecks, uh, some of the toughest implementation while working through it. And the regulator are going to decide how the spectrum is going to be allocated. And the operator need to also figure out the business case, right? People always ask for a 6G, how can you make a business case to deploy a nationwide spectrum, you know? Uh, network in this um, um, in, in this band, so we need to reach consensus to solve the problems, economical problems, the new use cases, and even you know we need to coexist with other you know uh, spectrum holders, satellite, uh, you know uh, also military, federal. There are many users in this region as well, so we'll figure out a way to coordinate with them and uh, make it happen. And earlier you referenced Giga MIMO. If we could maybe go a little deeper into the infrastructure implications of upper mid band. So, you know, Giga MIMO on the antenna side, and then there's some added complexity in the RF and baseband design too, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, it's, uh, we started the project about uh, three years ago uh, when FCC uh, chairwoman uh, talked about the US, they are going to identify 7 to 15 gigahertz uh, as the 6G band. So we start looking into the uh, integration challenges. How can you have more than a thousand elements uh, in an antenna array? Uh, FYI, for um, 5G, typically you have 100 or 200 elements in the antenna array, and you have tens of uh, tr radios of transceivers you know, connect to this uh, you know, antenna array. In uh, upper mid band, the expectation is you have thousands of elements. Therefore, we call it giga MIMO instead of massive MIMO. And you have hundreds of chains instead of tens of chains. So the level of integration will be much higher. Um, the good news is that there are some very power efficient ICs uh, that's actually available uh, for these space station radios. So um, this year, we are bringing in the hardware, uh, which is, you can see right behind us, uh, the giga MIMO base station uh, to MWC to show people with the same form factor, we could actually um, have the same coverage. Uh, we tested in antenna range, side by side with 3.5 gigahertz uh, massive MIMO system for 5G, and we're able to measure the same power. 
So it will take us a few more months to bring up the link with uh, actually also upper mid band uh, uh, device to show the OTA performance. So then we can have truly throughput um, services, all kinds of uh, you know comprehensive comparison uh, with uh, you know mid band. So in the context of 6G, you've given us a lot of good detail on upper mid band, but take me through this bigger picture in terms of you know where does low band fit in, where does mid band fit in, where does millimeter wave fit in? What's the all of it? That's, like a, that's a great question. Uh, I think one band is not enough uh, for 6G. 6G, I think we have um, um, the ambition to not only allow operator to uh, you know deploy a new nationwide. Uh, network to enable new services, but it also will give them incentive to upgrade their existing services. So in 6G, there will be new coding, modulation, waveform. Uh, they will, of course, be backward compatible for some of you know DSS. Dynamic spectrum sharing is a great technique to deploy new G on the existing band. It will enable that. So backward compatibility will be guaranteed, but will significantly increase the operational efficiency for the network. Um, you will be able to save more power, you will be able to reduce your operating costs, you're going to, for example, we can use AI to autonomous network operation. So there are many tricks we have to actually make all these bands work together. Uh, you can see millimeter wave will still be the you know, a workhorse for driving capacity because they have so much spectrum. When there is a hotspot, it will be a fool not to use millimeter wave. Right? But at the same time, we shouldn't try to fit everything into millimeter wave because it has this physical limitation. Then you have upper mid band to give you this overall lift of the wide area capacity. So 10x capacity is what we're planning for. According to the, I think, 90% year over year uh, you know, uh, data usage increase, right? if you extrapolate for 10 to 15 years, because the G will last that long, uh, you will see we will need upper mid band to boost the overall capacity. And then sub terahertz, you also mentioned. This is uh, probably it's not going to be the one that's going to connect you to a macro base station, but you can think of sensing or some fixed, you know, fixed backhaul, um, or even in data centers, uh, you have kind of mesh connection between the racks of servers. So there are many use cases. Uh, we can we think 6G can also enable with uh, sub terahertz. So holistically speaking, we need all the spectrum assets to give us a 6G experience, enable the 6G service at a cost that's much lower than 5G. That's a lot of complexity to manage, but it sounds like you have it to hand, so I really appreciate the update, Ting Fang. Thank you. I appreciate it, Sean.